My name is Amanda Brock and I am here to talk to you this afternoon about the Open Invention Network. My background is that I've been a lawyer for the last 25 years and for the first 15 years I spent most of my time working in big companies. I worked in companies like General Motors. I joined an open source software company 10 years ago, a company called Canonical. I don't know if any of you will know it. It's probably the biggest open source company headquartered in Europe and it distributes the open source operating system Ubuntu. So as a lawyer, I thought I understood technology and I thought I could tell you what open source was when I joined Canonical. And I understood that the source code, the human readable bit of code, would be freely available. So where a proprietary company would keep that secret and have a business model that effectively was based on the secretness, the, the secret source of its source code, an open source organization would share it. So an open source organization wouldn't necessarily have the same revenue streams from the, the privacy around the proprietary software. What I didn't understand was really what open source meant. And it's not just about the fact that the source code is shared. It's about an excellence of development, a modality of development where many different eyes are on the same piece of code. There's a, a phrase in English, uh, many hands make light work. And the same is true of software. The best software is developed when many different people cast their eyes over that software, look for the bugs, find the fixes, deal with vulnerabilities. So in the 10 years since I started working around open source, there's been an inevitability, an inevitability that open source would become mainstream. And I'm pleased to say that I think today it's there. And I think there have been three major disruptive factors in the last 10 years. The first of them is the adoption by big business, big technology companies of open source. The second, the Android patent wars. And the third, the digitization of all sectors and all companies. So if we circle back and we think first about the big technology companies, what they experienced was that the finest, the best software was coming out of the open source projects and they wanted to work with it. They realized that the developers working in their own time doing their own thing, contributing to this code. We're doing it in a way that might seem a bit hippie, but actually naturally fell into a structure and a governance and an order that meant that the modality of that development was bringing out the cleverest and the best in the software world. So why just leave that to your developers to do in their spare time? And what's happened with the big tech companies is that they've invested huge amounts of money and developer time into open source projects. And they've done that with existing um, packages and projects that you'll hear about, but also by setting up infrastructure. Now, we'll talk more about Linux and the Linux Foundation, but if I give you an example, in 2011, as a lawyer, I was asked to be part of the OpenStack organization, the OpenStack Foundation, when it was set up. And my role was helping on infrastructure, collaboration and cooperation between companies, how that could happen, what we would do with IP. But what the OpenStack um, organization allowed to happen was a cloud product to be built where people, companies, who would normally compete with each other would come together and work together, all driving in the same direction, all trying to achieve the same goals, and create a common base point in the software stack that they could all identify with. They could each then take that base point, put their own flavor, their own charm to that base point and actually distribute it and compete with each other in their own different ways. So we saw these big tech companies increasingly be willing to form collaboration and cooperation with each other. The second major change, I think, was the Android patent wars. I normally have my phone in my hand at this point and I don't have a phone to wave at you, but it's 10 years since the smartphone was brought out by Apple. It's not surprising that there was a response to that. It's not surprising that that response was open source and was the Android operating system. Now, when you think about it, a few years ago, I was told the average smartphone will have at least 80,000 patents in the phone. Now, those are gonna be owned by hundreds, if not thousands of different companies. In Europe, we're not so familiar with software patents. Um, 
As a lawyer, I wasn't particularly uh, informed about patents because I viewed it as something that didn't apply to software. And for Europeans, generally, it didn't. However, for a period of 20 years, what had been happening in these big tech companies is that they'd been applying for patents in the US and building up armories of software patents. Now, a patent is effectively anti-competitive. It's effectively a monopoly. I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but that's what it is. However, it's legal to have a patent to reward the innovation and the, the novelness of something you've designed. So there's a whole infrastructure which will grant you a patent, allow you that privilege, that monopoly over something that's novel, something you've invented, something that's special. And it doesn't just happen, you have to apply for it. So if you think about Android and its success and its disruptiveness, it's not surprising that the incumbent companies attack the ecosystem, not just Google, but the whole infrastructure around it, everybody who was distributing that open source operating system. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. It's already been mentioned, and you will all be able to go and look it up in the press. But we all knew what happened. Lots of lawyers got very rich, and people sued each other. The whole thing was a bit of a mess. We don't want to see that happen in other sectors because they adopt open source. And now we don't want to see the response to disruptiveness to new technologies being more patent wars. And the third thing I've mentioned is uh, digitization. Now, I hate that word. I used to say that companies were reluctantly becoming technology companies, but the management consultants nailed it with digital transformation and digitization. And I think for every single sector, you have to accept that what's happened is that whether it's your production, your distribution, or your consumption, something around your business, your ecosystem, is going to involve technology, software, and development. And what that's meant is that these excellent developers that I met in my open source world have started to be really attractive to those companies because those companies want their own R&D team. They want their own DevOps team working on the software specific to their sector and specific to their companies. And to do that, the, the, the digital transformation people are having to compete with the big tech companies, which means that to attract the best, to attract the excellent software developers, you have to work with the way they want to work with their societal norms and the modality of their software development. And what that means is that you have to accept that they're going to want to use open source because it is the best solution for many things. So bringing all of that back to the point of today's conference and EV charging, when I thought about it, how is all of this relevant to you? And I, I think everybody in the room will know about the charge point litigation that started in December 2017, where charge point alleged that a, a competitor had infringed four of its patents. Now, when I looked this up, the, the headline that I saw was, charge point loses bid, sues competitor. And that, that, to me, is very reflective of what I've seen in other sectors and something that you don't really want happening. And that's where OIN stepped in. So what is OIN? OIN was set up 13 years ago by six major technology companies, many of whom are major patent holders. And what they did was they committed the entirety of their patent holding into a defensive patent pool. So they've given their patents and made them available to each other and available for sharing to the extent that those patents read on a Linux system definition. So to the extent they fall within this particular open source definition, those patents are available to everybody else who wants to be in that group. They've also committed huge multi-million pounds, dollars, sums of money into that organization to build the infrastructure. So what does that mean? What it means is that any organization can join any individual, any company, any project at zero cost. So there is no cost to you participating in OIN, but by participating, what you get is a license to everybody else in the group. There are now 2,800 companies in there, and you will get a license to everybody else's patents. They will also get the same from you, and that's what you give up. Now, there are... Uh, no barriers to entry in that it's zero cost, but also if you don't hold patents, that doesn't stop you participating. And that's the core of what OIN does. It also has spent money defensively acquiring patents that it thinks might be relevant in the future, and all of its licensees, all of its networker group also get both an open source and proprietary license to that. Um, 
this is how OIN became involved in the whole charge point litigation. So not only does OIN have this formal structure, but it does other work around patents and open source. Part of that is providing prior art to patent examiners. Uh, patent examiners, I'm told, have 40 minutes to make a decision on a patent on some novel and new piece of technology. They'll look up a couple of systems where they can find the prior art and they make a decision based on that. So OIN helps to ensure that open source prior art is on those systems in the right format, but also actively challenges patent registrations in the US. So we monitor and understand what's coming through, and if we happen to know that there's prior art and that shouldn't actually be a patent, we're one of the biggest challengers in the US of patents. Um, we also work very closely with our community, and again, we come back to charge points. So we were able to support companies who have aggressors who attack on the basis of patents, and you probably all know that the outcome of the charge point litigation was that the four patents were set aside and held to be invalid. Um, I've talked quite a lot, I've got a little bit of time left, and I just want to leave you with a, a couple of parting thoughts. So, we've had a really, really busy October at OIN, and part of the reason it's been so busy is that Microsoft have committed 60,000 patents into our licensing pool. And they, they have a history as being a patent aggressor, but what they also have is taken a major step forward and they've accepted the inevitability of open source. They were the biggest proprietary software distribution company in the world, and they've accepted that by not participating in the open source community as good citizens, they won't be part of the future. They won't be part of the opportunities that open source is going to give. So to become part of that, what they've had to do is accept our open source norms and behaviors, and they've committed to be part of OIN. And since they signed up, we've had over 100 other licensees, including Facebook and Alibaba, join us. So why would anybody not be part of OIN who works in an ecosystem that involves Linux and open source? Um, our Linux definition goes back to the core of Linux, but it also follows adjacent packages, and it follows adjacent projects that you see coming up in the, the Linux Foundation, and those have included automotive with things like automotive-grade Linux, Hyperledger in the banking sector, and then most recently, power and energy. And I went to the Linux Foundation's first power conference in Edinburgh. So why would you not participate? You would, partic you would not participate because you're thinking of being a patent aggressor. Thank you.